Yeah, what we, we sort of have two sets of things to talk about. Um, which one do we want to start with? I'll also flag at the outset, I think we should stop at 10 minutes to the hour because there's something I want to show you before we break up this uh, meeting. So yeah, should we start okay. by talking about the Sam Altman interview or do you want to maybe get into the... Sure, the... yeah. That's... Yeah. I'm, sure, that's fine. I'm not sure how long this, this will take because we've sort of trod this ground many times before, but I thought it was worth mm -hmm. remarking on the... Uh, the themes that Sam Altman is bringing up in this interview as, uh, as you know, as being the kind of things that we've been talking about. So for those of you who don't know, Sam Altman is the current CEO of OpenAI, uh, one of the major independent research organizations doing cutting edge uh, research and deep learning. That's the organization that produced GPT-2, 3, and Dolly, and so on. And this interview, which I think is, I mean, it got, I noticed that a few days ago, uh, I think the, the conference where the interview took place was actually recent. Um, so let's, I made a list on Discord. I'll just go through some of the things that I thought were noteworthy. And by the way, I guess Sam Altman is... Uh, considered to be one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse by AI safety, like uh, alignment people. So uh, he also spoke a little bit about alignment. Um, nothing too interesting, okay. I would say. Yeah, so the first thing I noticed... Yeah, the, the, yeah go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. I, 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 one, one line in particular caught my eye, so you go first, and then if, 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 you, if it didn't catch your eye too, then I'll add it in. Okay. So... Uh, the first thing I write up here is uh, he cited his basic model for the next decade is that the marginal cost of intelligence and energy is is going to go to zero. That's the one. That's the one. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. the one that caught my eye. <laughs> yeah, all right. And that, yeah, okay. So that's, I guess, uh, pretty... Maybe it's not obvious that he would have added the energy one in there, uh, given that he's the CEO of an AI company. Uh, but yeah, it's obviously relevant. But I think the the follow on from that is is one that I think is not as obvious and which uh, which we may find interesting to discuss a little bit, which is. He pointed out that as the marginal cost of both of these goes to zero, you might think that, uh, well, that just means that the current usage just becomes much cheaper. So we stay roughly at the current level of consumption of intelligence and energy, uh, but just the, the amount it costs goes exponentially down. But he points out that as the marginal cost goes to zero, uh, we expect spending on both of these resources to actually rapidly increase, um, which is something Adam has highlighted quite a number of times as being characteristic of disruption. That's right. Yep. And I, I, sh I should note that that, uh, that that idea doesn't originate with my team. We're sort of drawing focus to it. And we've, we've what we've pointed out is that this has happened many times in the past. Um, the the and I suppose approaching a marginal cost of near zero is is a little bit more is a little bit extraordinary because that hasn't happened. That is all I should say that's only happened in recent decades with the digital revolution, basically. So that there were very very few instances of anything like that in the in the 19th century, for example. However, the idea that as as um, as costs of any kind go down substantially, that you can have uh, uh, a, 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 a price elasticity of demand such that you get a massive increase in um, expenditure around uh, whatever that thing, whatever the thing is whose costs fall. That's, that's been, been observed for a very long time. And uh, William Stanley Jev Jevons was the first to right. um, point to this in energy in the 1800s. And that was before the marginal revolution and before the concept of 
uh, elasticity of demand, price elasticity of demand was 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 formalized. So this is an idea that's been around a long time. But what's weird is the idea that it costs could approach zero, and that as they approach zero, um, you could have an explosion in in consumption of whatever those things are. Yeah, maybe let's de- so this is, debate this is, that point a yeah. little bit. Is it is it? He said the marginal cost of intelligence would go to zero. I, I think he's just sort of speaking a little bit off the cuff. I'm not sure if he really believes that because a little bit later in the conversation, he was talking about how one of the biggest policy questions of the next few decades will be who gets access to the AGIs and on what terms. So that hardly suggests the marginal cost is zero, or at least it's not... uh, it's it's not it's not zero for everybody. It's not it's not abundant necessarily. Um, I mean, the, maybe we should maybe we should clarify what one means by the marginal cost going to zero as compared to the cost going to zero. I mean, as I as, right, as those I'm, are two quite dis- different things. In fact, the marginal cost can go negative under certain circumstances. Um, so, for, for example, for part of the time, the marginal cost can be negative for certain things, and you can still have a positive capital expenditure required to, to you know, build out the capacity to produce whatever those things are. So, a, a marginal marginal cost is where the is the is the the, the cost required to pr- produce an additional unit of a good or service, and for um, for digital technologies, this is very familiar. So, it it, it it's it costs you several hundred dollars to buy a digital camera or a, or a device like a smartphone that has a digital camera in it. But once you've made that capital purchase, that capital investment, and you've got that capital in your hands, you've got that, that piece of equipment in your hands, then it costs near zero to produce one, one or uh, one additional image from it. You, whether you produce one or 10 or a thousand images with your smartphone, it's it's barely noticeable on an incremental basis. So that's what we mean by the marginal cost is uh, is near zero. And there are some exotic market circumstances where we can see negative marginal costs. I'll give you an example in the energy sector. So because of um, some perversity in in uh, the wholesale markets in electricity, um, there are situations where coal and nuclear power plants really really don't want to ramp their output up and down. That's expensive and hard on their equipment. And so what those plants will do is they will pay people to take their electricity so that they don't have to ramp their production down and then back up again later. And when they do that, the cost of an additional unit of electricity on the open market can be um, negative. And so for about for approaching 10% of all hours in California now, the cost of electricity on the wholesale market is actually negative. The marginal cost, so the cost of one additional unit of electricity, and on the it, it, from a wholesale perspective for buyers in the wholesale market, is actually negative. Now that's not negative cost for producers, but it's a negative cost from the perspective of where it's consumed. So we have some some those are some examples of maybe it's, of where we see near zero costs. So in the in the situation that I suppose OpenAI would be in, uh, maybe an example of near zero marginal cost would be. It costs twelve million dollars to train GPT four, but then to serve each request that a user submits to summarize a document or uh, provide the meaning of life or whatever the the marginal cost of doing that is just the inference cost, which is not zero, but it's some amount of electricity and usage of hardware somewhere. It's probably not zero, but it's um, very low and especially low compared to the original capital cost of training the thing. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, that's, that's fair. Uh, in energy, we're, we're, I, we've, I, we've talked about that in the past with the, our, my team's concept of superpower, producing at very, very low. Uh, what we, we say near zero. We don't ever say zero. We say near zero marginal cost. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, extreme, you could also say ex- just extremely low. <laughs> um, and I, I think that Sam Altman was right when he pointed out that anytime there's a major restructuring of cost throughout the economy, that this triggers other sorts of change, um, it, 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 social change, uh, economic, economics, finance change, geopolitical change. And so, 
I think this is an important observation, certainly. Matt, what was your point about security there? Just that the, the abundance is not necessarily a good thing, I guess. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So you said, Dan, you're not sure he believes in the, let's even say, near zero marginal cost, because later he says we still need to worry about who is going to get access to it. Mm. But I think that consistent you could have something that has near zero marginal cost or is abundant but that uh you don't necessarily want anyone to have access to it because it's dangerous right so if there are risks associated with the resource you still need to control access even if the resource is abundant that's a great point yep hmm. yeah I haven't listened to the interview, so I'm not sure um, if that's consistent with, like, if that actually resolves what um, Sam Altman was saying in those two places. Of the yeah, I, I doubt that's what he had in mind. Uh, I maybe uh, it's, it was a very it was just a couple of sentences. Um, I think I think he had in more in mind it was a kind of question of social justice uh, who gets to. Let, let's take a concrete example. So, uh, Geordie Williamson, who's a famous Australian mathematician, um, had a recent, recently did some work with DeepMind, where they, uh, DeepMind researchers collaborated with Geordie to look into some problem in his field of mathematics, and they, they discovered some patterns and maybe managed to prove some interesting conjectures about those patterns, and that's. Uh, I don't know much about it, but it seems to be a substantial piece of work. Now, not every mathematician would have been able to take advantage of that opportunity to work with the researchers at DeepMind, but they basically... Uh, so right now, that that resource, that is, work with an AI in a very deep fashion, get it to look at a problem you think is interesting, discover patterns, make suggestions, and help you discover something is an opportunity that's available to, well, maybe one or two or three top level mathematicians who, you know, are tapped on the shoulder by DeepMind or OpenAI or some other research organization with the resources to provide access to that kind of system. Uh, suppose that Geordie goes on to do that three times a year, but, uh, you know, who else gets to do that? So it's at the moment it's it seems like it's a bit of an unfair question in a way, and I'm not criticizing Geordie at all for it, right? It's just it's cool, you know. They they come to you and they ask you, would you like to do this thing? Um, why not? But as this becomes a more routine practice, it will become analogous to well, if you're at a good university, you have access to more compute power, and in these days you have access to more GPUs. Uh, once there are AGIs on the scene. I mean, depending on what happens, who gets to collaborate with them may be the dividing line between, I mean, if there's a phase transition in scientific research where those working with the AGIs are doing all the interesting work, which seems completely plausible, if not inevitable to me, then who gets to decide? Uh, so that's that's the kind of justice question I think he, he had in mind, or at least that's that's how I read it. So he did, he did mention at some point that access to AGI systems is uh, likely to be the currency of the realm, which I thought was a, a nice quote. If the intelligence was really abundant, then you wouldn't have this problem. So it must be that, yeah, like you said, there's some bottleneck um, in deploying or sort of like widely distributing the, the actual access to that intelligence. Um, I don't know if is that would that be then counted as part of the marginal cost? Well, this brings up another, another interesting, another interesting issue, 
we were asked, my team's asked about this quite a bit, and we don't quite have an answer yet, not a complete answer at any rate, which is um, uh, if the marginal cost approaches zero and uh, markets, tend, whole, markets tend to clear near the marginal cost, so when you, it, under, under circumstances of, of strict competition, so when, when, when you actually have a competitive market, um, the clearing, the clearing price is often quite, often typically quite near the marginal cost. Of course, what that means is, and this is one reason why we have this strange situation in the energy uh, sector right now, is um, when the sun is shining, uh, and different producers are competing with one another to sell their electricity. Solar can underbid just about everybody else they can underbid coal they can underbid nuclear they can underbid underbid natural gas because their marginal costs are so low so anything that they get from selling a unit of electricity they benefit from because it costs them so little to produce it on a marginal basis and so that in other words that makes that that makes it very difficult for anybody else to compete with them and in a competitive market you know you get you can see how you would that would drive the clearing price to the you know the, the, towards zero okay well here's the problem the problem is that you still have to justify your investment in capital. So if you want to build a power plant, you have to have a way to expect returns out of that. And if if mm -hmm. your marginal cost is zero, um, then it's an open it's a it's a difficult and you know uh, question. Uh, how do you rationalize making the investment, mm -hmm. and uh, how do you expect to get a return on that investment if you're you're anticipating a competitive market in which <laughs> in which the price is clear near zero and so this how do you get any profit out of so that? it's more like in, and it's, um, it's more like a the british government investing in the merchant navy or something to go out and grab a fixed resource from somewhere and bring it back uh, rather than investing in a long term i mean if you you can still make money while you're taking it off the nuclear power plant or the coal power plant, right, while the capacity from the solar system is still less than the total demand. That's right. And so this is one one uh, possible contributor to the, the, we've talked about how these the adoption of the new technologies um, tends to follow a sigmoid curve, an S curve, right? Well, one, 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 re one reason why you might expect, for example, in the energy uh, case of the energy disruption one reason why we might expect that adoption would slow down um very definitely ce cease to grow exponentially at some point and begin slowing down is when the market starts to get saturated with solar and then it becomes harder and harder to justify additional investment in capacity because of diminishing very uh, you know aggressively diminishing returns on that investment mm -hmm. So, but as I said, my team, we've not completely gotten through all of this um, because the biggest question is, is uh, again, how, how much demand will there actually be and um, how much innovation will there be in, in finding ways to capture value outside of the traditional sort of just sell a unit of electricity. So, for example, if you were to look at the Internet naively from the from the you know, from, from say 1995 that, you know, when you were to look out into the future, it might be difficult to imagine how, you know, you would continue to make money selling information and selling communications and, and selling, you know, related services. If the marginal cost of information and mm -hmm. communications was so low as near zero, how, how would anybody make money, let alone, you know, create trillion dollar companies like, you know, Google and Facebook and Apple and so forth on that. Um, and uh, so, but it turns out there are ways to, to you know, to, to, to continue to innovate and continue to create and capture value. So it's, it's we, we're, we're, what we're imagining as a result, just again, I'm sorry to keep invoking energy here, um, but maybe more something more like an internet of, of energy um, and services that are, you know, exotic and more interesting than just buying kilowatts hours um, as we have in the past. So energy as a service and, and so forth, maybe something along those lines. We'll, again, my team hasn't worked all the way through these details, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a big question mark. It's, it's, it's you know, the, the cost costs of the cost of the system isn't zero. It's only the marginal cost of each additional unit of electricity that's going to be going to approach zero, and it will be the same as Matt said with with intelligence, right? The cost of the cost of these models and the cost of 
training them. And that's certainly not going to be zero anytime soon. Even if the, even if energy becomes very cheap, you know, we're not, we don't have rep, Star Trek replicators and we're not anywhere near that. So we're, we're really not approaching zero for the capital investment that's required. In these yeah, days. actually it was interesting to um, hear Altman refer to just the, the roof on the number of chips that are available as a, as a key constraint. So he was talking at the beginning of that interview about the business models he expects to be adopted going forwards, where he thinks there will be, I mean, somewhat self-servingly, of course, uh, a few organizations that train the largest models, and I guess he has in mind orders of magnitude bigger than anything that currently exists. Uh, there will be a few organizations that train those, and then a whole sort of economy that sits on top of those models, fine-tuning them to specific data sets or somehow interfacing with them uh, in order to serve various verticals. Uh, and the reason he put forward for that is not only a limitation of talent. I mean, it takes a lot of engineering and, uh, you know, across an increasing number of areas of computer science and engineering and, and so on to run data centers and supercomputers and clusters and so on to train these models. But there's also just not that many GPUs so that you can't have hundreds of companies training models at the cutting edge. There's just not enough A100s out there. Uh, and so he sees that as a, I suppose, one of the reasons why OpenAI, I expect, uh, thinks it will be one of those companies, or at least OpenAI slash Microsoft. Um, well, one thing that I just, um, was wondering when he mentioned that in the interview, one thing that came to my mind very immediately was, um, well, first I thought, well, geez, how many, how many different, um, uh, how many different, you know, you know, specific applications would you need fine tuning for? And then, my, and, and so initially my mind was, well, you know, there's, there's, yeah, you, know, you could do art and you could do, you know, music, maybe a few different kinds of art and maybe, you know, people might have different, you know, and so I struggled to think of, Oh, I a, think a scenario where you had where you had dozens or hundreds or thousands, let alone tens of thousands or millions, of of um, fine tuning jobs that you would want to do on some base mo on, on some handful of base models. But then, then it occurred to me, really quite quickly, and I wonder if Altman was thinking this: um, if you had if you had robotics and you had them operating in physical environments. There's a very large number of physical environments in the world. So never mind like market categories or, you know, mm -hmm. types of services um, or, for, you know, forms of creativity. There are lots and lots of those. But if, for example, you want to take a base model and train it to operate in your factory or your house or, you know, operate in your hospital um, or, you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. Well, well if, if, if you want to take a base model, uh, very much the way I, I up until now have been for a number of years, years I've been thinking, well, you know, you train a car that can drive itself and you take the same basic model and you adapt it to driving in, in scare quotes there, um, driving in, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the parts bin at the warehouse or the, you know, something like that. And so it, I, I maybe it, it occurred to me that maybe that's the sort of fine, an example of, of a very large amount of fine tuning that would be beneficial is this sort of fine tuning that can happen four physical spaces of which there is a, there are a very very large number yeah, i think that's likely to happen uh i think he may have may have had in mind easier things just uh like fine tuning on a protein database to make a, a model that is good at predicting the affinity of drugs for certain purposes or whatever um, but it does it does look like robotics is going exactly the way you described the latest work out of google is exactly taking large language models and similar vision models and just basically plugging them into robots with some fine tuning uh, in order to provide the kind of reasoning capability for the for the robots so that does it does seem like in particular one of the areas where you would make use of one of these very large models uh, would be in robotics applications just as a kind of common sense understanding the universe how things work understanding instructions 
a kind of symbolic language layer in order to reason about objects in the world and how to use them. All of that has been demonstrated now, at least in principle, by the latest robotics work out of Google and other places. So that does seem like the... Uh... Um, uh, having said that, and this is a question that I have for you guys, the, 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 the last thing that, that occurred to me, and again, it's a question, is... Um, is it is there is there is it really likely that we're going to need to fine tune indefinitely or is it not is it simply not plausible that you could train a sort of master multimodal model that can just be optimal at everything in other words like you know with human beings you know you, you, you everybody sort of achieves a, every every neurotypical person achieves a, you know an approximately baseline uh, you know, understanding of physics that allows them to walk across the room and, and, and function in normal ways. But you really have to do a, a, a great deal of additional training and fine tuning to become a professional athlete. Yeah, that's what and Matt very just few pointed people out succeed in the chat. doing that yeah. in more than one. It, oh, sorry, did I miss something in the chat? I know, no, Matt was just saying that that's, yeah, we built our economy on fine tuning humans. <laughs> oh, yeah, I see. Sorry. Um, yes, 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 exactly. Um, so, but what I wonder is, I mean, if if you uh, if if you can if you can continue to train something, you know, at, at, at a um, you train your master model, um, are, are, is there going to be value to find? Is there, in other words, I guess what I'm trying to ask is, is there going to be a point? In a point meaning, is there going to be a continued return on investment in fine training um, beyond, you know, uh, some baseline that you can achieve with training the, the master model? I, I, I mean, if the master model can do right. 10,000 hours of every conceivable physical activity, you know, would you really need, would, wouldn't it be good enough? I mean, if, if it's, say, say you train a, an AI robot to, you know, um, you know, in agility and dexterity and so forth, and it becomes, you know, more agile than the best Olympic athletes in across every sport, 10 times as good as them, you know, it's had it's had a million hours of, of discus throwing training and a million hours of high jump training and a million hours of jujitsu training and a million hours of whatever else. Are you is there any point in additional fine tuning past that? I mean, I guess that presumes a static background to adapt to. Um, go ahead, Matt. I think it's a, it's a cool analogy. The, the, the human um, version of this is, like you said, one, uh, well, maybe imagine the population is like suddenly able to uh, communicate lessons learned, like an, a lesson that any human learns in the world, suddenly you also learn that lesson. And all of the lessons that you learn in the world are suddenly learned by everyone else. Right. Um, and then, but so, so that's, I mean, I guess that would, it's not necessarily architecturally possible with humans, but it might be possible with um, a larger, um, a larger single model. Um, one comment that I have is that I think that the the like system that humans have, where like uh, you sort of start from scratch every generation, and you have to well not from completely from scratch because you have your kind of um, <laughs> instincts, but um, but you more or less start from scratch in terms of like you have to humans have to every human born has to like relearn culture and everything like that and then all of their skills um this plays like some kind of regularization role right so mm -hmm. if some generation goes off and finds some really complex theory um in in research and like un understands like a single person in that in that uh field maybe understands some really complex idea in order to like pass it down education through education to like the next generation it's that's going to like, that's maybe like a useful process in terms of actually, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure exactly how to say it, but, but like when I learn something, I, I understand maybe like the high level, simple ideas and, um, that's what gets passed down. That's like a kind of regularization. It's also an um, evolutionary, passed down through generations. also an evolutionary pressure because what gets passed down is usually yeah. that which you can teach to many students and they then teach students or write it down. It's not just a single, usually it's not sufficient to just work it out on your own and even write it down. It's can it, can it actually be put into other people's brains? 
in an active way and and that determines what gets communicated yeah you could you could imagine you, yeah, ju you so just accumulate I'm, yeah sorry go ahead i think i was probably going to say a similar thing you, you maybe you can maybe you can just accumulate this stuff I, I think it's conceivable that you could have some replacement for this regularization or evolutionary pressure in the model mm -hmm. um but if you but you know that's that sounds kind of, I have no idea how you would do that. Um, it's not as simple as just remembering everything you ever learn in every situation. It seems like you need something more. Yeah, I think my, my take on Adam's comment is, is relevant here. So while that seems true, you could imagine a master model being trained on every current task. Well, what if there are new tasks? There's always, as the sphere of capability of our civilization expands, it will, there will always be some advantage, marginal advantage to being, paying more attention to a particular thing because the, the generalist model has to absorb a lot more and will by definition be slower. Even if it only takes 500 milliseconds to master a skill, you're still going to be faster mastering one than a hundred. So I guess there's always some advantage to specialization, even if it's at a much, much higher level of capability than, than what we're currently doing. I mean, I, I think that seems to me to be what's happening with... Uh, th there is still some value to fine tuning. And in the next generation of models, it won't be exactly fine tuning. It'll be like, you know, stick some information into a very long prompt or the, the precise technical nature of specialization will change but i think they will at the same time as the generalist models expand their capabilities rapidly they will be always on the frontier uh, use for more specialized models i would think very interesting um shall we uh, move on to the other topics you wanted to discuss adam otherwise we'll use up all our time uh sure yeah thanks dan um I always lose track of time when we're having these, these discussions. Um, uh, okay, so, well, it's not unrelated. I, you know, I, I think we can make, maybe make some connections, certainly to the near zero marginal cost things we were talking about. Um, but okay, here, let me, let me just paint the picture very quickly and, and, and broadly. The thing I was thinking about is um, our, our measures of, uh, our, our measures of, and, and metrics for understanding our economy uh, today, and and uh, they're they're pretty. I, I, so I think that it's a problem that we do a lot of our economic thinking in abstractions. We abstract away from the the layer where stuff is really getting done, the physical layer where there are flows of energy and materials and information, and we're making stuff and performing services and people are getting real useful value out of that you, you call it utility or, or or use value or whatever you want okay um i, I think we do a lot of our reasoning uh, and then of course policy making on top of that and decision making and planning investing and so forth um in in, in, a, in in a in a layer that's abstracted from from the ground reality so that's that's one piece of context there um so okay Here's the, th here's the thought. Um, we are, our, our economy to date and ec economics ex itself is defined by scarcity. How do you allocate scarce resources? Markets are one mechanism for doing that, right? So, so markets are, an, are one, only one of, of a number, but they're, they're particularly effective, at least when they're reined in. Um, but it's all about scarcity. We don't have enough of the things, the goods and services that that we'd like to give everybody and so we have, there we have to allocate and we've a lot of futurists generally agree that we're headed towards a world where things are much more abundant and one can imagine just for the sake of a thought experiment you know sort of a star trek kind of future when there's an arbitrary large quantity of any good or service available for negligible cost you know so if you have the replicator for example um uh, and you have an arbitrarily large amount of energy available and arbitrarily large uh, in, in intelligence and, and in information processing capacity, then you would have a situation where very little was scarce. 
in that circumstance, markets are not really necessary. They don't really function. There's not for, for, for most things. I suppose there are some things for which there might be artificial scarcity or a few things that might be gen, re, genuinely remain scarce, like, you know, priceless ancient works of art or beachfront property in Malibu. I mean, these things are finite. Um, but a lot of things are going to be super hyper abundant. And we I don't think there's a whole lot of disagreement among most futurists that that you know that uh, the economy must look very different uh when markets sort of cease to function and we shift away from from a paradigm of scarcity to one in which abundance is much more widespread and we've already seen some major steps towards that specifically in the information and communications domains um okay so that's all premise here's my question my question is if gdp measures productivity gdp which is a very a fundamental metric that we use right now gross domestic product so it measures uh production and and there, there it's not the only it's not the only thing there are lots of other things that, that have that that are in the picture gdp is is very badly flawed but but for, for what it is right now we depend we we depend on a lot gdp is a rough measure of productivity and the consumption that is sort of concordant with that and uh we have already seen instances where technology causes sort of a, a, a deflationary dynamic radically slashes the cost in some cases towards marginal, a marginal cost of near zero. And as a result, uh, productivity increases, but GDP fails to capture mm. any of that production and it, it vanishes from visibility. It ceases to be visible or legible to that metric. I'm specifically talking about the metric of GDP here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, if it's, oh, and, the, and, a, and a good example is your smartphone and how it has, you know, you can take digital pictures, you can navigate, you know, you've got a compass, you've got, you know, entertainment, you can play music and all these things that, you know, 30 years or 40 years ago, would have been physical products or, or services that you purchased. And it's not an exaggeration to say that you, you can, you know, you can get millions of dollars worth of 1985 value um, out of your smartphone. And the smartphone is only costs $500, so let's say. So, the, so what's interesting is that all of that productivity, the production of those goods and services still occurs. The product, in fact, more we're producing more images than ever producing more um, content, more video, more producing, 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 and consuming, consuming, consuming more in that domain, again, information and communications than ever before. But none of that shows up in GDP. It's all invisible to GDP. Okay, so here's the question. The question is, does GDP, as we move towards abundance, does GDP shrink? Does GDP actually have an, so much uh, ephemeralized out of its vis out of its vision, out of its ability to capture, uh, that as we sort of race up towards hyper productivity, um, GDP not only ceases to be a meaningful measure, but it's just, it just it 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 might actually look like it's declining. It does it, so that's that's the first that's sort of the one, hypothesis number one. Is that is that sort of plausible given the flawed nature of GDP as a metric? Okay, here's hypothesis two, which I'm much more interested and excited about. Hypothesis two is, what would the beginning of that journey look like if GDP were to start to, for example, basically just collapse in its usefulness? And it would be a very bumpy ride, would it not? And what would the beginning of that look like? And would it look like anything that we're seeing already? Mm. That's my question. Can you repeat hypothesis one or question one? Is GDP So hypothesis one is, will, as productivity skyrockets and um uh you know as, as sam alton was saying the, the marginal cost of of intelligence and energy approach zero the marginal cost or the cost in general of many other things will approach zero they will become less and less visible or legible to gdp as a measure mm -hmm. because things will disappear out of markets they will cease to be traded on markets they will just be They'll be too cheap to bother trading on markets, and so they will therefore cease to be measured. Mm -hmm. um, can we imagine a, a, a scenario in which this happens to so many goods and services across the economy that D GDP actually declines yes. as a measure? Where it, there's just there's less and less to measure. That's hypothesis one. Hypothesis two is: Are we seeing the beginning of this now? 
what if, so that I, I guess another way to ask the uh, another way to ask it as a research question instead of a hypothesis per se is what would the beginning of that uh transformation of gdp look like mm. and is does that does what we would predict it to look like align with anything that we are seeing right now there are ways in which the global economy is confusing at the moment yeah let me so we're, we're we're by most measures we're more productive we're producing more goods and services than ever but uh uh you know, we're talking about recession. We're talking about inflation. We're talking about a deflation at the same time. There's the, we're, we're, there's a lot of chaos right now. And if one were to imagine GDP sort of on the edge of beginning to turn negative, despite the fact that productivity is increasing and increasing and increasing, well, maybe it would look an awful lot like the confusion we see right now. Hmm. So anyway, this is this is on my mind at the moment. I don't know. Does, any, does that sound crazy or is None, that plausible? Not at all. I, just, I could. Uh, just, isn't, isn't this what? Uh, I'm not sure if the incels are the correct label for the category of young men who have just disappeared into video games and are not interested in in taking out mortgages or getting married or having kids or, or just can't acquire those things even if they want them. But, I mean, there are large groups of people um, in, at least in China and the US, I don't know about Australia, um, who basically are opting out of the usual economy to a large degree right they're not getting jobs or i mean it's a question of whether they can't get them or just choose to not pursue ordinary careers and mortgages and you know having a family and the degree to which they want those i mean do they want them and can't get them or do they you know do they not want them from the beginning but uh it does seem like there's the, the number of hours that people spend playing video games in particular is, is maybe an indicator of a form of, I mean, it's a very cheap form of entertainment compared to, well, okay, maybe not, maybe compared to watching TV, it's it's kind of comparable. Um, yeah, let me switch tracks a little bit and just comment on something Matt said in the chat before I come back to that, perhaps. Uh, you mentioned positional goods. I guess positional goods often do show up in GDP figures indirectly, right? So you could think about uh, often businesses like bars are set up to monetize seeking positional goods. Um, so for example, just to give one example from China, you know, it's, it's the high status thing to buy a particular alcohol that's really expensive and then you know share it with your buddies. Uh, so there's the economy is hooking into positional and status oriented desires quite a lot. Uh, I guess the the positional goods themselves, depending on the form they take, may not show up in GDP figures. But uh, that that seems to be true of a lot of things, right? So I think Adam, what you mean is it's not it's not like everything that is valuable to us currently shows up in GDP figures, but to a lesser or greater degree, it may have proxies that show up. Mm. I'm not comp yeah, not I mean, scarce, again, not, there's, there are a lot of things that are going to remain that are going to remain scarce, and I, and and I suppose there's there are behaviors that 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 construct artificial scarcity. So the things that are, I think, genuinely physically scarce, the property on Mal waterfront property in Malibu, and then there are sort of positional goods that can be that can be socially constructed. So, you know, there's perhaps no sense in, in which, you know, a certain bottle of alcohol would fundamentally need to be scarce, but we may we may for social reasons construct an artificial scarcity because of its, you know, it's for, for, because of in service of social dynamics. Um, uh, another thing maybe to just inject into the conversation, we've only got a couple of minutes left here, is that um, again, just to kind of get below the layer of abstraction measures you know things like GDP and markets and supply and demand and employment and and you know um, uh, money itself. Those are all abstractions. If you look if, if you look beneath that at the actual product production productivity, like how much materials, how much energy are being moved around, those are all growing. And so GDP per capita is 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 up. GDP per capita is growing. But the, the one thing that's quite astonishing to me is that the the pandemic just showed us how few people 
actually are necessary to to contribute to, to whose contributions are really necessary to maintain that productivity. Wait, I'm confused about so, that. So, and, and, the pro so the uh, aren't the employment isn't the employment don't the employment figures uh, isn't unemployment very low in the U.S. at the moment, or at least it was recently? It is, but it's only low in the official figures because so many people have stopped pursuing jobs. Oh, I didn't realize that. So they're, yeah. So the, the people are just out of the market. They, this is the incel, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, and that's not a very kind word. But um, there, there are people who, and it's not just young men. There are a lot of people who have simply um, exited the job market and are no longer looking for jobs. And as a result, um, they're not included in those unemployment figures. So there's some gaming of those yeah. of those figures that's Billy's, important to think about. But just in a sorry to interrupt, but Billy's, sorry, just, Billy's just, making just, a good point that go yeah, we shouldn't probably use this term. Uh, I, I do mean something more like the the Japanese shut-ins rather than I guess incels has a kind of misogynist uh, meaning. So yeah, maybe. Yeah, right. I mean just uh, I mean maybe also shut-ins is a kind of more specific movement i mean there's a whole thing in china which they call laying flat uh, so may, maybe maybe i want to call it laying flat there's a that's okay. a more gender well, the, neutral let, let, term then, for it. then let's add that to to several other groups of people who are not in in, in, in wealthy modern societies who who are not actively um productive they're consumer. They consumers in the sense that they consume goods and services, but they aren't actively participating in the production. So, for example, for example, um, you know, children don't contribute to the economy for a very long time now. I mean, some, in some cases, we basically remain children and don't really make contributions to the economy until we're in our early twenties. Mm. There's, there's huge numbers of people in, in modern society like that. There are more retirees than ever before. Um, uh, so there was so there's, there's a, you know, young people don't work, old people don't work. And then what we saw during the pandemic is that a lot of people in bureaucracies are doing all that much product, productive work, right? There's, there's quite a bit of room in many bureaucracies for people to step out. And then, of course, this is the phenomenon of uh, bullshit jobs, which is at this point pretty well documented. So what's fascinating is that GDP per capita has gone up continuously and exponentially for centuries. And yet fewer people are working today mm. in mo wealthy modern countries than than as a percentage of total population than ever before. So the actual productivity per person who's act, who's working and being productive is, is even greater than GDP per capita would suggest. So what, we're already hyper productive by any reasonable historical standard. Um, anyway, that's the just just one more thing to put into there about this as GDPs go as you know as productive pr productivity climbs. Um, increase continues to decrease exponentially. What happens to GDP and other economic abstractions that we currently depend on yeah. for making sense of the global economy? I think this might these two hypotheses might be a good thing to revisit next time, and maybe we can. It might be interesting to give out some re optional readings on this on this topic um, before next week. Sure. Yeah. That's great. Let's okay. Do it. Um, so the end of seminar activity is to. Add the third hypothesis. Yeah, thank Matt. thanks, Matt. Let me just get a screenshot of that, and I'll um, I'll add that for next time. Cool. All right. So if you come over here, you'll see uh, the ghost here is left behind uh, something that you can follow. So please go ahead and activate that proximity prompt. So this is our first attempt at a gallery. So these are all images that were made by Dolly, this uh, open AI algorithm. I guess it sort of starts over here, not that there is a particular starting point. Ooh. So there was uh, the prompts for some of these were kind of interesting. So it's sort of calligraphy based. 
So maybe maybe it's a good idea just to wander around and see if any catch your eye. I don't have anything particular to say about them. Find anything interesting, Adam? <laughs> AI art dungeon, that's right. Okay, for those of you who can hear me, thanks everyone for coming along to the Disruption Seminar. And uh, we'll see you next week if you're joining for that. See you, everyone.